Welcome to our session on reducing the cost and risk of dementia. We're so happy to have you here with us today. I hope you've enjoyed the conference so far. And as you know, or if, if this is your first day here, we wanna make sure you get a copy of our new report, Reducing the Cost and Risk of Dementia, which should be on your chairs. And we'll be talking about a little bit today. I'm gonna briefly introduce our speakers, but we wanna get right into the conversation. So I won't spend a lot of time. Their full bios are on our website or our app so that you can find out. Um, to my immediate left is Michael Belleville, who's a dementia advocate here with us today and with Dementia Care Alliance, Dementia Action Alliance, excuse me, you wanna get that right. Jenny Chin Hansen, who's the immediate past CEO of the American Geriatric Society. Um, and also, so many of you know, she founded the first PACE program uh, in, uh, on lock in California. So Jenny's very well known to many of us in the aging field. So it's a delight to have you with us, Jenny. Um, next to Jenny is Kevin Crane, who's the managing director, head of workplace solutions integration at Bank of America. And then next to Kevin is Jeff Huber, who's the president and CEO of Home Instead. And finally, we're pleased to have Sherry Ling, way down there, hi Sherry, who is the deputy chief medical officer at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So let's get started. Sherry, um, in your role, I know that you're also a geriatrician by training and you have a committed focus on the achievement of meaningful health outcomes for patients and families through the delivery of high quality person-centered care across all cares of setting. In our report, we talk about, oh, this isn't working, could you advance, there you go, uh, the five goals that we have in, uh, to promote strategies to maintain and improve brain health for all ages, genders, and across diverse populations. I won't read out the slides, you all can read them, but what uh, the overall uh, effort that we wanted to, to work on, and I think this has been a theme of the conference that I just wanna set the stage, the prevalence of dementia across the globe is really overwhelming. As we look at how many people um, are projected to have dementia, mm -hmm. and certainly uh, with, without a cure uh, available for, um, we're, we're looking at new ways and new strategies to think about risk reduction and prevention. And, CMS, of course, covers all of our Medicare beneficiaries in the country and Medicaid beneficiaries as well. And people have talked about how uh, this disease, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias can really might overwhelm our system in terms of changes that we can make. But I know Sherry has thought long and hard about these issues and she's also an expert on our Medicare payment rules. So, what are some ways you think, Sherry, we can improve brain health and reduce disparities? Yeah, good morning all, and Nora, and thank you for the kind invitation to be with all of you today. Um, it is quite an honor. Um, so um, I think uh, the challenge that we have ahead of us or with us today is, is quite daunting. Um, and I uh, really want to congratulate the Milken Institute and, and this effort in providing a comprehensive approach that is not just about a treatment. Um, and I think that really emphasizes the importance of what we can do in the here and now, which is better manage uh, people who uh, have dementia, are at risk of developing dementia, and their care partners is part of this um, entire solution, which is actually not just nice to have, but is necessary um, for the sake of sustainment of our, our system of, um, this is actually a national issue. So um, at CMS, as, as a, a payer, and a payer, the largest payer globally for healthcare services, you know, touching upon the lives of one in three Americans. Um, we have uh, mindfully introduced um, with our, through our payer role, different payment opportunities, billing codes that really acknowledge and pay for time of clinicians, 
to uh, both um, detect that there is cognitive impairment um, and also using standardized screening tools or to standardized tools assess the, the extent to which a problem may be um, apparent or perhaps subclinical or not quite apparent. Um, I think the signals uh, really come to us from different uh, parts of our environment, different perspectives. So really glad to, to see um, the, the uh, diversity of the perspectives represented here, including uh, banking. So um, we pay for individual treatments and services um, and have broadened the opportunities that clinicians can then take to detect that there's a problem um, to actually provide a diagnosis so as to better manage. The challenge that we have, and I think which is really an opportunity, um, is that um, uh, we are one part of the solution. So payment is one necessary but not sufficient part of the solution. We create the opportunities for important conversations between clinicians and the people who they serve. So, you know, none of us uh, some of us work within a healthcare setting, none of us live within a healthcare setting. So real solutions for healthy aging and, and healthy brain, we have to take an approach where we provide opportunities to all of us to engage in our own healthcare, um, whether it's prevention or actually more effective management. Great, thank you so much. And, and when you read the report and know um, one of the things that, that we launched back in 2015 as part of the White House Conference on Aging were dementia-friendly communities that really embrace the notion uh, that people living with dementia have adopted uh, the phrase that many people with disabilities say of, uh, you know, nothing about us without us. Yes. And, and we really feel strongly that that's an important principle as we study any disease and try to come up with solutions and how to work together to talk to people about their, their lived experience. Yesterday I shared a bit about my own experience as a caregiver. My father had Alzheimer's disease and uh, my aunt and two uncles. So it really has impacted my family a great deal on many levels. Um, one of the things we've talked about and write about in the book is how people living with dementia are treated in our healthcare system and how our workforce isn't well prepared uh, for, for helping people that are living with dementia. So today we're really delighted to have Mike Belleville with us. Um, and Mike uh, would, was gonna tell us a sto uh, the story and his journey about his own diagnosis with Lewy body dementia and, and how that went with, for you and your wife. Sure, well again, thank you as well for, for having us here and giving us a voice. Um, it's, uh, it's a real honor to be here. Um, I was diagnosed when I was 52 and a half and there was obviously a lot that preceded the diagnosis, uh, you know, what the symptoms were and things that were happening. But the delivery of the diagnosis was um, a, a wasn't what I thought it should have been. Uh, a doctor who was, you know, obviously a very well qualified neurologist, uh, very nice gentleman. We had been seeing him for some time. After all the testing was done, uh, sat my wife and I down and said, here's what all the test results show. Uh, we're pretty certain that you have younger onset Alzheimer's. Um, I'm going to start you on this medication and I'll see you in six months, and he walked out the door. And that was it. Um, there was no referrals to <clears throat> support groups. There was no, here's what you can expect. There was no, you know, there, there was no nothing. It was, it was basically go home and get your affairs in order. Uh, and that, those stories, and, and you've shared that with me before, it's just such, it's so, troubling because we don't want anyone to feel that but I, I know and I shared yesterday we had so many experiences the same with my father 
and you know, you, you and your family, my, my family, many people in this audience end up having to, I think when we talked on the phone, you called it, we looked up Dr. Google, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was my wife, Cheryl, actually. Um, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest with you. The first five or six months um, after the diagnosis, I was, in a, I was in a pretty bad place. I was you know, already in a you know, depressed to begin with, but I went into a deeper depression. Um, and my wife, uh, thankfully, got on Dr. Google and started searching and she uh, said, you know, enough is enough. Um, she probably said it a little differently, but we'll just, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll go with that. Um, and um, she basically said, we need to do something. And fortunately for us, she found our, our local Alzheimer's Association chapter in Massachusetts, uh, which led us to uh, probably the number one thing that I would recommend for anybody is uh, support groups. It wasn't until I sat down in a room full of other individuals who were going through the same challenges um, that I realized I wasn't alone. Mm. And you really develop some incredible bonds with, uh, with these, uh, with these we, we're family. I mean, we actually, we call ourselves family. So, but, but again, like you said, um, we were pretty much left up to our own devices as to what do we do from here. There was nothing in place, no care plan, no action plan, no nothing. So. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I think, you know, we'll touch on all of the goals a little bit, but I want to um, turn to Jenny Chin Hansen now who, and if we could put up slide two as well. Jenny, um, you know, has been a mentor to me for a long time. She was the president of ARP when I was there. Um, and, and, you know, I really, She's really a special person. And I got to see her recently speak about this exciting project she has going on in San Francisco. And uh, so I had to have her here in the conference and she, she made an extra trip to turn things around to be here to talk about what they're doing in San Francisco. So Jenny, please share some of that and what, what brought you to that place too. Okay, thank you very much, Nora. Um, first of all, again, as others have said, thank you very much for taking on um, this focus and having a chance to really do a, a highlight for all the reasons that I think that Sherry brought up, how important it is as part of our health and well-being for the country, for individuals and families. And so um, how I came to this, because I noticed I'm, I'm listed as the uh, immediate past CEO of the American Geriatric Society. And with uh, Sherry being a geriatrician, one of the things our society, which is about uh, physicians and nurse practitioners, social workers, pharmacists, who focus on people with complex uh, conditions, older people. The thing that we know about our, our background of geriatrics, uh, even though it's a highly skilled area, highly needed area, and especially as our demographic trends, myself included, are coming down the pike, not that many people really go into geriatrics. Um, there are reasons of payment that uh, Sherry knows are important. Ironically, if you get trained extra as a geriatrician, you end up making less money than if you were a primary care doctor, which doesn't make any sense, but ah, that's policy. Um, the thing that I, I, the reason I bring that up is because we knew that, that there are not going to be enough geriatricians for the demand, prior to my even arrival at the AGS, um, the John A. Hartford Foundation funded all these medical specialties to really think about how they might take their specialty, and now I'll, I'll go specifically to emergency medicine, um, might focus on uh, older populations with complexity. So we're really lucky. I don't know if many of you realize that the uh, uh, EDs, uh, emergency departments, emergency physicians, are a young medical specialty. They're only about 27 years old compared to um, internal medicine. But we have some enthusiastic um, young emergency physicians who are interested both in re uh, research and leadership. And they realize when they come through, um, when older people come through an emergency room, what they're prepared to do as emergency medicine uh, is not quite the same cadence as people who come through with multiple chronic conditions and oftentimes in a situation where they may have some cognitive loss, if not some form of dementia. So that environment is not ideal 
for helping people, and many people have gone through that experience with their loved ones. Fast forward to, to now, um, the profession itself, uh, individual emergency uh, physicians recognized this and took it upon themselves with one beginning project in New Jersey, maybe about 15 years ago, to develop different approaches and protocols for this. So this speaks to two of the objectives that um, Mil Milken has in its report. One is preparing the workforce um, for better uh, competency and knowledge for this. And then the, f the other objective is to provide services that are more conducive to people who are living with some form of cognitive loss. So those two objectives, four and five, really tie into this approach of making a, an emergency room more capable, um, not just physically, say lighting and, and, and um, uh, different furniture, but the ability to make sure staff are better uh, equipped and knowledgeable to do this. So fast forward to the fact that four professional so societies came together from emergency medicine, the American Geriatric Society, the Emergency Nurses uh, uh, Association, and the Academic um, uh, Society of Geri excuse me, of, uh, of uh, Emergency Medicine that focuses on geriatrics, came together and worked on this for years. Um, fast forward to a year and a half ago, um, national accreditation was offered to emergency rooms that choose this journey to be accredited uh, for uh, a geriatric emergency departments. And so uh, the slide that you see is at the benefit of the West Health Foundation and um, the CEO was here yesterday and had a chance to uh, uh, say some comments about housing, but one of the sentinel pieces of work that they have done is really move this work on uh, developing a geriatric emergency department and spreading it. So what you see on the slide is uh, starting at the very top left, it was in May that there were eight accredited geriatric EDs. The accreditation is really at three levels, level one, two, and three, which is how emergency departments are accredited. Level three is the beginning skill level. Level one is the highest uh, level of, of skill. So uh, there are eight. Uh, now we're talking about just barely a uh, year and a half later, there are 105 accredited. So this is moving quickly. And one of the reasons they moved toward accreditation was to see that uh, hospitals that realize um, people are looking for friendly uh, EDs don't just put up a marketing sign that we're a geriatric uh, ED. There are you know, formal certifications that they have to go through. And it's interesting, um, even though many places are benefiting from um, some funding from philanthropy to start it, it appears that around 90% are able to start moving on this without major funding. And uh, the bottom line four points include uh, the fact that there's sa satisfaction is greater, beginning findings about lower costs, uh, the idea of hospitalization. In other words, just because you go in the ED and you have um, uh, conditions that are, are, are of this nature, many people really don't need to go into the ED. And then even upon uh, going home within the month, people don't fall as much. So these, this is very early um, data collection. And what we're doing in San Francisco is because a major philanthropist um, went through this personal experience. And even though uh, the family had been very generous to fund um, issues of, of, of aging as well as dementia uh, to hospitals, he himself went through a very tough experience being in an ED for 12 hours or more still going through this. So uh, upon his passing, his family has moved this effort to see, could we do better in San Francisco? Because this is where he, he, he lived. So um, I was brought in to the advisor to see if we could do that. So I was so grateful that I knew all these people um, in emergency medicine and, and got sufficient information. So what we're doing in San Francisco now is to not just have one hospital you know, be the best in, uh, uh, in, in, in the practice, but let's get the whole community of hospitals involved because in emergency medicine, as you know, uh, there's always diversion. 
So even if there's one hospital that was certified, you know, and the person ends up going to another hospital, that doesn't help that person that there happens to be one hospital. So this is meant to be a regional effort of bringing people together. Look, we all compete on other factors, but we're all facing this, and it's a unifying experience. Um, I sent an earlier slide that showed that um, sometimes the physicians themselves had years ago uh, collected some data um, amongst all the different hospitals, and they, they personally said, you know, about 70% of the older persons who come in who have some kind of memory or cognitive loss really didn't need to use the ED. You know, so um, so putting people sometimes through that experience actually caused their condition to get worse. So this is where it's recognized. You know, this is a community need. This is a family need. This is a personal need. And so I'm just delighted that um, we're moving ahead with working with uh, the city of San Francisco. We work with the West Health um, uh, Foundation in addition to the uh, family philanthropy. Thank you, Jenny. And, and just to, to follow up a little bit on, on that, but first I, I had the opportunity to, to visit the geriatric ED um, at the University of uh, California, San Diego, which of course West uh, Health Fund is state of the art. I mean, if we could have that everywhere, I think you know uh, it would be a much better place in our country. But uh, just to bring home to some folks in the audience that might not recognize what some of the special features of a geriatric ED would be as they, the, the, as Jenny said, the lighting's different, the furniture, everything is there more, uh, it, people don't come in through the emergency door, they have a separate door which is calmer, a place where people can, all of the staff there are trained uh, to, to work in, in geriatrics. And things as, as such as like the, they, they do uh, can use technology now to make the physician's voice go right to the the ears of the patient at the uh, in their bed, so that many times we find with older people with hearing loss, they miss many of the instructions that their doctors give them uh, because they can't hear, and because it's a very chaotic environment, uh, the the pictures, everything that's chosen um, is meant to provide a soothing environment rather than what most of us have experienced in emergency rooms, which is anything but soothing. So, so it's a, a really important work. And the other thing I'd mention just. Um, to bring Sherry back in for a second because I'm very excited about one of the CMS demonstrations that's really looking at um, ambulance providers and, and paramedics and you know one of the things they're testing which I think uh, I, I'll let Sherry talk about but being you know someone who uh, experiences with many members of my family of the really the trauma of taking um, someone with dementia to an emergency room and how stressful it can be for the person as well as caregivers and some new payment rules that we hope are going to test that. Cherry, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, just, um, just briefly. So through the Innovation Center's authority, and this really illustrates how critical it is that we take a broad view, that we look at all of the different pieces uh, for solutions that can contribute to a total you know, a total uh, future where healthcare is more person-centered and and really does acknowledge um, and compensate for the challenges of the experience. Um, so the emergency, so it's ET3, and I'm, I'm let me see if I can get the acronym correct. So it is emergency triage, treat, and transport. And the concept is just this. So in the current state, if you call 911, they will take you to the closest emergency department that's in, on your route, where you are assigned, by where you physically are. The concept is that um, it provides uh, the, the system the opportunity to, to either transport, but the alternatives are to transport to a location that you would prefer, or perhaps even triage and manage there on site. So, you know, this is also a way that the community, the system can create its own solutions and infrastructure, right, to, to fit around that. But it's all about how you can pay for something 
different in a different way. And the key point is that um, we hypothesize it will improve patient outcomes, right? And 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 that is something that is something you know that the emergency geriatric emergency department accreditation that is also what you're you're lining up towards to be able to provide a alternative experience if you will that is better aligned and better suited for for older adults and um, just just to say it i think um, none of us are at our best right when we are patients so this actually is suitable regardless of age, but in particular when you have multiple competing medical problems, um, it, we have to be extra thoughtful and to be able to provide the environment and the system to, to coordinate that care and deliver to better outcomes. So great, thank, thank you, you Sherry. So. Kevin, I'm going to bring you into the conversation, and, and uh, someone might say one of these are not like the other, and say, why do we have a banker here talking about dementia? Um, can you talk a little bit about Bank of America and the role you all are playing on this? Sure. Um, so I'd like to thank you, Nora, personally, um, because you've been a big help to us about how we think about this issue going back to the Obama administration, the 2015 event, as well as the work with the Milken study. So to Nora's point, and I actually would broaden that, I mean, it's not just Bank of America, but why, why shouldn't financial services be much more active and involved in this? And, and we're asked that a lot when we, when we sponsor studies. And if you think about it, I mean, think about us, we service one out of every two households in America in some way, shape, or form. So if there are 40 million caregivers in the United States, millions of people obviously dealing with the issue of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's, the households we touch are dealing with this issue. Um, the average age of a, a Merrill Lynch Wealth Management client is 65 years old. I mean, entering in um, those stages of life. I mean, we service employees and benefit plans and the average age is in the mid 40s. A lot of them are facing the issue of caregiving. Um, certainly as a bank, uh, financial fraud abuse, um, the, the ability and the, the need to detect that and help people. But also there are the positives of the longevity economy. Uh, people over, I'm 59, so I'm about to enter the stage, people over age 60 are spending money and at somewhat accelerated rate than the younger population. Um, and then the economic shifts, I think of the industry Jeff's in and the growth and the dramatic growth of that. So really the question should be, I mean, this is, this is a foundational grounding um, principle that should be in financial services. The place I want to talk about for a minute is um, the goal five, the workplace. Uh, we do annual research around financial wellness of employers and employees. And for the first time ever, we've done this for nine years, the major component of that study was on the topic of caregiving. And why it was on the topic of caregiving? As I said earlier, 40 million caregivers in the United States. But the issue more is in talking to employers and employees, there are tremendous disconnects in terms of the feelings that are out there. Employees, and there's some level of stigmatization, many of them do not identify themselves as a caregiver, even though they are doing caregiving. Employers completely underestimate the number of employees that are caregiving. The productivity impact that employees doing caregiving, on average, as we found in the study, spend at least 12 hours a month. The gender issue of women, I mean, I, I was my father and mother's financial caregiver before they passed, my sister, who was a nurse, was the physical caregiver who had much more to do. Women versus men. Where does this impact? The median retirement savings of women is $30,000 in the workforce. Of men is $100,000. Why? Women, in many cases, have to take leaves and leave the workforce more than men. So when we think, and, and we're thinking about how do we work with employers and employees, to me, the most prevalent issue out there besides retirement savings is this issue of caregiving. Um, so let me just spend a minute, I mean, so what are, what are we doing about that? Um, the first thing I think that needs to happen is working with employers to have much more robust caregiving benefits. One thing we found in this study, 88% <clears throat> of employers said to us, oh, I, I, I have things to help people with, employees with caregiving. Less than 30% of the employees actually understood it, and then a small portion of them utilized it. So there's a major disconnect. The issue is the benefits need to be much more robust. Um, something we started to do with the bank is legal support for people. 
so they can get the documents in place. Support in terms of, I would say, the work that Jeff's doing, support in terms of when we found when a caregiving event hits an employee, it usually is quick. It's at an emergency point. This happened with my father. You have to pick the option of care very quickly, giving them counseling and support to do that. The other thing I would say that is equally important, and I, I, I'm taken by your comment, Mike, about the community aspect. The biggest employee network at the bank is the parent and caregivers network. They want to talk to each other. And it is the most emotional thing. When we present caregiving results to employees and we talk to them about it, it is the most amazing thing. Normally people, you have a tough time in a big room to get them to ask questions. They won't first ask a question, they'll tell you their entire story about being a caregiver. I've never seen this. I mean, we do events in local markets, same thing. So the network and the community and the socialization that they know they can come to each other is critically important. And then the last thing I would say in terms of a benefit is managers. Managers of employees need to be more understanding and reflective of what their employees may go through, empathy, resources, and otherwise. So I'll finish with, um, you know, as we look at a firm, we look out. One thing that's very interesting is if you look at wealth management, we have 2,000 financial advisors now that are accredited in longevity. I've been in financial services 40 years. I never would have thought 20 years ago a financial advisor managing people's assets need to be more expert, but they do need to be. They do need to be more cognizant of the family and the element of that. Uh, certainly focus more on managing, helping people with their finances based on life stages, not based on assets. Third, the early detection, obviously. Being cognizant of something looks different in someone's financial life. I mean, the first thing we found in cognitive decline is the first thing that goes usually is managing finances. You know, my father passed two years ago. I have his checkbook still. It is sad. This man was a CFO of a company. It is sad, and I keep it and look at it, to see the decline over the years of him trying to manage his finances and whatever. So we have to be cognizant and help of that. And then the last two things is caregivers need help in terms of a toolbox. I was a financial caregiver because my parents thought I was in financial services. I had no idea what to do day one. I'm like, yeah, I'm in financial services. I don't know how to get a power of attorney, third party. So they need, they need help and, and, and prescriptive help. And then the very last thing is, interesting at the bank, we actually now have a gerontologist on staff. Sorry, who's here in the audience. Which I never would have thought that's the case. So this is an issue, not only Bank of America, but financial services industry should be much more foundationally centering all their businesses around because it is a reality in terms of managing people's financial lives. Great. Thank you, Kevin. So, so helpful. And, and Jeff, I, I um, you know, want to turn to you. Uh, you know, many of us, we talked about some of the ways we can improve our brain health uh, yesterday and getting more sleep was one of those. And Last night, the, the Nats won, which is great, but I didn't get enough sleep. Um, but I will use my baseball metaphor to say you can be our cleanup hitter here. And, uh, you know, because I just know what the work we've been so fortunate uh, uh, to work with so many partners um, on this report. Bank of America, uh, many in the audience, AARP, us against Alzheimer's, um, Biogen, others that are listed in our report, and certainly Home Instead. And we're very uh, happy to have worked with you and learned from your company. So can you tell us, I know, you know, all of you all, and it was a really a consensus building process. We had a lot of input from our government expert friends, too, who, uh, you know, have kept us really uh, to know what data were the most uh, important that we should focus on, uh, but we learned a great deal that for you, for you and your company that are you know in people's homes, uh, working with them. Whereas we know that's where uh, we all live and what's really happening and where you can influence uh, people's experience. So. Thanks for your patience. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I appreciate the baseball metaphor. <laughs> um, I use lots of sports metaphors. Uh, I can tell you from experience, the baseball metaphor does not work in the UK, however. So <laughs> just don't go there. There, Try something else there. Uh, well, first, I just want to say thank you, Nora, to you, and congratulate you and your team at Milken for a great report. Um, it's a very clear statement of what the issues are, very clear goals. And we're really happy to uh, support it financially and to contribute to it. Um, and we're really happy to help advance those five goals. Um, our, our work at Home Instead 
really cuts across so many of those, but I thought I'd focus just on a couple of them. Um, first goal, goal four, about building a dementia-capable workforce across the care continuum. Um, as you can see, if you could advance the slide, we're really active and very busy in, in helping to support many organizations that are working so hard to find a cure or to find an effective treatment. Uh, but uh, as we know, uh, that's that's not in sight right now and until there is a cure there's a massive need for care and that's that's really where we have our focus uh, it's been on care and has been since day one our very first client 25 years ago in Omaha Nebraska had Alzheimer's disease and since that time it's become just a major major focus for us uh, today this very day we'll be in more than 90,000 homes in 12 countries across four continents uh, two-thirds of those clients have Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia. This year we'll provide more than 80 million hours of care. Most of that care is gonna be dementia related care. So we see the risk and the cost of dementia at some scale every single day. So creating a, a home care workforce that is highly skilled in caring for people with dementia, that's exactly what we do. It's obviously been a major focus and we invest heavily in our training and developing that workforce for our caregivers so they can provide the most highly personalized care experience possible. And what I mean by that is that our caregivers uh, need to have a, a surface level understanding of the disease and the pathology so they can be empathetic to what's going on. They need to be really, really skilled at tactics and techniques to provide care. But what's most important is that they have to have a really deep understanding of who that client is as a unique human being. We wanna know everything we can about Mike, for example, who he is, what his passions in life are, what his career was, where he grew up, um, the things that make him tick. And our caregivers then use that information to provide a really uh, customized, uh, personalized care experience. Uh, and we can, we can custom tailor our, our care approach. I'll give you just one example, if you'll indulge me. A little more than a year ago, I shadowed one of our caregivers, did a client visit, um, in London, a uh, beautiful uh, lady in her 90s, she had spent her career in the field of engineering, was a real pioneer in engineering. She'd written a textbook about engineering. And I spent about a half a day with our, our professional caregiver um, getting to know Margaret. And um, at one point, it was time to eat and time to take her medications. And Margaret was just really resisting, um, as, as we know. Um, our clients can be and it was very getting almost combative. And so um, I took her textbook off the shelf. I said, Margaret, would you, would you tell me, walk me through your textbook here? And her face lit up. And even though she was in advanced stages of Alzheimer's, she, um, uh, sat down with me at the dinner table and started leafing through her textbook. And everything about that experience immediately changed. And pretty soon our, our professional caregiver then brought over the meal and just sat it down, brought over medications and put them down. And without any hesitation whatsoever, Margaret began eating, began to. So it's, it's that kind of information that we can use to really create a, a highly personalized care experience. This training's won numerous awards, including the Queen's Award for Innovation, which is the highest award available to a private enterprise in the UK. It's won the Princess Award for Training. And to the point of reducing risk and cost, it's really effective. We know that when we are part of the equation, our, our clients are gonna access the healthcare delivery system at a much lower rate. They're gonna have fewer doctor's visits, fewer emergency room visits. Uh, they're gonna uh, have admissions at a much lower rate. If we're part of the discharge plan, they're gonna have much lower readmission rates. Their length of stay is gonna be lower. Uh, so really it leads to higher quality of life, better outcomes, uh, not just for the client, but for everyone around that client, um, certainly the family caregivers, um, and it allows them to remain exactly where they want to be, where they choose to be, which is at home. But we also understand that uh, not everyone uh, can afford uh, a private service like Home Instead Senior Care, and there's a lot of work to be done uh, to increase accessibility. We work really hard in that area as well. Big part of the conversation in this conference is, is helping to, how do we fund long-term care 
important conversation that we need to make headway on, and, and we're happy to support those efforts as well. Um, but you know, right now there are just limitations to who we can serve with excellence. And while not everyone can use Homestead, we feel a responsibility uh, to provide everyone with something, whether it's uh, a free resource. We have toolkits like you were talking about. Uh, I'll talk about those here in a moment. And so that's, I think, where we can contribute and advance goal number five, which is uh, about establishing services and policies that promote supportive communities and workplaces. So for example, that, that training that we developed, we offer that free of charge to anyone, whether they use our service or not. Um, so we have 1,100 locations around the world. Those locations will offer workshops to offer that same training to family caregivers, or anyone can access it online uh, at caregiverstress.com or helpforalzheimersfamilies.com. I encourage you to go and visit and, and take, the, take the training. We have a book called Confidence to Care, which is a really practical how-to guide uh, for a family caregiver uh, to tools and techniques to, to care for uh, someone who uh, is struggling with dementia. That has a free companion app, so if you're in the heat of the moment, you can pull up the Alzheimer's and Other Dementia companion app, and if you know dad is refusing to take a shower, you can type in bathing and get some practical tools And when you're right in the heat of the moment of caregiving. Uh, we have a partnership with Hilarity for Charity. This is uh, Seth and Lauren Rogan's uh, organization. So we're the exclusive provider of their care grants. Uh, so we can provide respite care for families and, and provide free care to families who are struggling with this. Uh, we've trained thousands of organizations and businesses and therefore tens of thousands of their employees on how to be dementia friendly. We've, we've trained the entire House of Lords, for example, on, uh, on our uh, dementia friendly workplace. We help to uh, fund local nonprofits uh, on our crowdsourcing giving platform called Give65. So if you're a nonprofit organization, you can visit give65.org and we'll help you to raise funds locally and we'll help to match those funds through our, our foundation. So we'd love to help you raise funds locally for senior-related organizations. Uh, and then if I can, just two more things I'm really, really excited about. Um, we know the need for care is so vast and it's growing exponentially. Uh, we want to help uh, <coughs> engage the entire community to rise up and help care for uh, their, their neighbors and their uh, fellow man to, to, to give them uh, care and education and what's needed. So we've created a, a, a site. I would, I would love for you all to visit imreadytocare.com. I'm ready to care.com and you, you put in your, your cell phone and every Monday you're going to get a little bit of information by text about uh, an uh, age related issue topic and then a simple care mission. So it might be say, say hello to a senior and we'll educate you a little bit about social isolation. So we'd love for this to spread. It's not branded home instead. It's, it's just our way to help get communities uh, activated to help care for uh, their neighbors. And then the, the last thing, and Nora, I want to thank you because you helped us with the ideation of this. Uh, but we want to create the next generation of leaders in the aging space. And we really want to take a, a Teach for America approach. And we're just getting started with this. Uh, but So we've, we've launched last year, we're in the second year of a pilot of Champions of Aging. And this will be a deep uh, service year opportunity, part time for college students, and then a full time paid year of service where uh, for people post-college, maybe a gap year experience, where they get a deep, immersive uh, understanding experience in aging. And whether they go into an age-related field or not, they will take that love of seniors and a deep understanding and help transform their organizations uh, going forward. So we're teaming up with Service Year Alliance. We're teaming up with General Stanley McChrystal, who's really passionate about this idea of paid service. And we want to make sure, and he's going to bring it to the presidential campaigns next year, we want to make sure that aging is an important part of that service conversation um, and bring it to the forefront. So those are a few of the things that we're doing to help advance uh, the goals to reduce the risk and um, costs of, of dementia. Well, just a few. So <laughs> thanks for knocking it out of the park there. No, thank you so much. Um, so I know we're going to, we, I want to get to Q&A because I know people have some questions and, and want to be able to ask their own questions. I just want to say I was so struck when Kevin was speaking and, and I know, um, and Jeff, when you talked about Margaret, how it just, for those of us who, who uh, have 
lived with people living with dementia, it brings back memories. And you know, today, uh, you know, the the Hill published an op-ed that I did talking about many of the issues we raised about how the burden often falls on women. And uh, and I talk about my own aunt Trudy, who was a, a Juilliard trained pianist. And it really. Um, you know, she didn't have kids. Uh, she, she at, at the time of her life, she had to choose between uh, a career and a family, which is, and, and she chose a career, um, and she didn't have much savings at all because, you know, towards the end of her life, she was a piano teacher. Mm. And, but what brought her so much joy and made me think about, um, you know, Margaret and her engineering book was in, in uh, the home where she lived, uh, towards the end of her life, she would play the piano for people there, and you know everyone that lived there loved it. All the care, you know professional caregivers, all the visitors, and you know that was when she was happiest. And you know sometimes we'd all sing Christmas carols in July because that's what she could remember by heart. But you know that was really um, uh, very meaningful, and I think really just uh, continuing to uh, you know, recognize the humanity in all of us and uh, how much we have to offer still at, at whatever stage we're in. So thank you for that. I want to ask uh, just one question that we didn't really touch on. If we could go back to the slide with all the goals. Um, and I'm going to start with you, Mike, and then maybe ask Sherry to add. But I think one of the challenges we've had and one of the things we really talk about in the report is the importance of early diagnosis mm -hmm. and screening and how when you know um, when, when you get that diagnosis earlier you can come up with some strategies and hopefully now we're able to really bring all these tools to you about um, what are some of the support groups but but also what to know about your disease so um, tell us a little bit about, Mike, uh, just the screening process and how you know, that was for you and how it might be improved. Sure. Um, the thing that um, struck me is when uh, we're talking about the banking, uh, looking back um, after we got our diagnosis, um, there was a time where uh, we realized I could not use an ATM machine. And I'm, I'm a tech guy. I would, I've been building computers for 30 years, putting them together, taking them apart, everything else. And it, it just became kind of a family joke. You know, oh, here's a computer. You can build a computer, but you can't use an ATM machine. Not realizing, you know, what was going on. And especially things that you're talking about in the workforce. When things were happening to me, we noticed it at work before we noticed it at home because of the type of work I was doing. Um, it was, I was a telecom, a telecom tech. So, I mean, if you really think about it, you, you probably spend more time with the people you work with, um, sadly for some people, than you do with your, with your own family. So education in the workforce, to me, is that's one of my passions. Um, I really think that there really needs to be more emphasis on that. But the thing that really struck me was that there is no cognitive uh, screening. I mean, I was diagnosed young, I agree. I mean, I was, like I said, I was 52. But there's, you know, cancer screening at certain ages. There's all types of different screens. Why isn't there cognitive testing as part of a normal person's health care plan? You know, at, at age 30 or, or age 40 or whatever it is, so that they at least have a baseline so that in the future, if things do start to happen, you know, you, again, early detection, as we've been talking about yeah, the last absolutely. few days, is important. Um, you know, especially, you know, with Dr. Tansy talking about it yesterday. Um, I honestly believe, um, you know, being able to get on the medications I've been on have, you know, obviously helped keep the progression of the disease where it is. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I can't stress enough um, the importance of, of getting a proper diagnosis um, as early as possible. Again, I was initially diagnosed with the younger onset Alzheimer's, but three years later, they changed it to Lewy body dementia because of the type of other symptoms that were happening. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really critical. Um, and I applaud you for everything that you're, that you're all doing in, in the workplace because it's, it's, it's desperately needed. 
Thank you. And, and Sherry, I know CMS is working on this, you know, from the clinical perspective. Can you tell us, like, just a few of the barriers to, to early cognitive screenings and what, what we're trying to do to improve that? Sure. So I, I'll start with one of the barriers at, um, to actually um, having consistent screening in the context of some of the preventive health visits. Um, and that is uh, what we need is the evidence that the, our, our colleagues in the Unite, uh, U.S. Preventive Task Force can actually say is sufficient to support the notion that screening actually translates into better management um, and better health outcomes. Now, having said that though, all of the signals that we have heard this morning from Mike um, and uh, are, are out there. there. There are some warning signs that um, actually could be detected in the context of some of the preventive health uh, visits. So even as they're currently constructed, you know, to look for those errors that are happening in financial management, um, to look for the m mistakes and misuses, not intentional, but, you know, taking your medications in a way that they're not supposed to be taken. I mean, these could be warning signs to actually then uh, take a closer look. Now, the, the benefits already exist, right? Um, the annual wellness visit, and certainly, you know, for other health plans that, that cover be, uh, the population younger than the Medicare population. Um, it, so those benefits exist. The challenge is, what are the barriers to their use? We know there's variability in, in the uptake across the country of something at like the annual wellness visit. But we also know that systems that provide better coordinated care, such as accountable care organizations, we're getting some inklings that the uptake is, is higher. Um, so I think there's some promising signals out there. What we also have done, and, and it, enabled is um, there's quality measurement um, as a vehicle to incentivize um, detection, uh, better management of people who have cognitive impairment, regardless of what their specific diagnosis is, because we, we struggle, right, with, with the diagnosis. What do we call this? Um, but it enables clinicians to actually report by way of some of these measures and enhancing the uptake of something like the preventive health services that are already available. Clearly what we need to know, we, we don't know what we don't know. So if there's something that is hard about how those benefits are and those billing codes are actually constructed, it is not apparent to us which actually speaks to the importance of us understanding what the barriers are by directly hearing from clinicians, from systems, and from our beneficiaries, right? We need to build a better journey, and that journey has to be along multiple lines in a very broad way. And so some of our, our colleagues who, who we rely upon how that journey will roll are actually here in this audience, both within HHS and also external to HHS. Um, we can build a better journey, um, and I think the, the pieces are here. And I, Jenny wanted to say something. Kevin, jump in. Jenny, go ahead first. Okay. Um, I, I think, um, Sherry, you, you've brought up all the kind of uh, factors of systems appro you know, approving. Um, it, there are probably tools now. I, I uh, know some startup companies that are able to do this in terms of um, uh, eye screening and, and all. I'd like to just raise the issue of the fact that many people still have very conflictual feelings about knowing. Um, and so that emotional component of there's the technical side and the structural side, there's the personal side and the ability to uh, think about the, the stigma and the fear of not knowing uh, what can be done. So and I think as Mike said, you know, having it earlier on in our lives, right, normalizes it more to have cognitive screening. So it's <clears throat> not, you're afraid of that 
bad diagnosis. But, but I'd know. like to push back on that, okay. that, that, that it's, it's true that we would like to do that, but it still is such a powerful personal journey. Right. Um, and that, I, I'm looking for, you know, perhaps the sharing of some practices uh, that help us kind of go through that ability, because it's not like a moment's decision. It's a process. I mean, even once getting a diagnosis, how do you process that for Absolutely. a month? So I'd love to see some conversation about it, because we may have the structural pieces to say we could, we could screen earlier, we could be quite accurate, but then what? Mm -hmm. you know, then what for the person, then what for the family? Go ahead, Kevin. <clears throat> so I'll carry on with that, because I think that's a really great comment. If you look at like our business, one thing in wealth management that's evolved, exactly to your comment is, if you think about, let's say, a financial advisor is sitting with a, a, a primary account holder, and that person is exhibiting some early signs of cognitive decline, um, normally the spouse is there. We have had to, had to train financial advisors on the psychology that the spouse, in not wanting to take away the respect of the individuals having the issues, is giving verbal cues to the financial advisor about where the relationship is changing and where the business should be more done, exactly to your point. So that, I mean, it's an entirely different element of, of helping someone with their financial life. And the key is, exactly your point is, we need to understand the family much more, not the individual, because the family is obviously very involved in this. The other thing I would say as financial services is we have lots of information now, lots of information. We, we see patterns, we know patterns. You know, uh, there was an example recently in our retirement business, someone withdrew three times in a row, $500 from a retirement plan. That is not normal. We could see that. We have to act on that. Now you need to have access and all that, but we, we should be far more responsible with the data we have to be able to act on it, anticipate, and work again, not just with the individual, but with family members. So I totally agree, which is it's a very, you've got to help the psychology of it with others helping and supporting the individual with the issue. So I know Mike wants to, to make a comment. We'll turn to him, but I just we want to take one or two questions from the audience. So please raise your hand so they can bring you a mic. But go ahead, Mike. Uh, the, only, the other thing I wanted to add, why I believe um, early diagnosis is so important, and it's, and it's one thing that's really not, I don't think, talked about enough, is the person getting the diagnosis has to have the opportunity to decide how they're going to live the rest of their life. I mean, it's, it's more than just getting a diagnosis. It's, I mean, the journey is a journey and, and point A to point B is gonna be different with everybody. So what are you gonna do with your life between point A and point B? I mean, one of my favorite quotes from Shawshank Redemption, get busy living or get busy dying. And I've chosen to get busy living. So, but people need to have that opportunity given to them. So I just wanted to stress that. Uh, we'll go Sarah Locke up front. Hi, Sarah Locke from AARP, and I want to thank this panel um, for giving hope in a situation which so many families struggle with, and it is so complicated across families, across finances, across health care, and you've just done a magnificent job. So I really appreciate that. ARP is very happy to work with the other partners to support Milken's efforts in this. And Nora, you've done a fan fantastic job. But Mike, you just said something that I really want to underscore, and I want to turn it into a question for Sherry. And that is, diagnosis is really important so a person can choose how they will live for the rest of their lives. So let's talk about the outcomes and the evidence and the difference of management that healthcare providers might be able to engage in that spans more than your physical mm -hmm. um, immediate blood pressure or, or me measurement in medicine. Let's talk about outcomes and management that can result in a better quality of life mm -hmm across the span for themselves and for their family members. How do we address that to get the evidence we need to turn the tide on this question of cognitive screening? Mm -hmm. So um, if I can paraphrase, Sarah, thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, when we look at the op what the needs are, 
we have to look at what are the opportunities immediately before us, right? We have each unique perspectives and contributing solutions. How do we then knit it together to achieve the outcomes that are most meaningful? Um, and I think we have, you know, some understanding of what outcomes might be meaningful on a population level. However, we, what we want to build towards is the opportunity that each person, each person's outcomes that they specifically desire are really the true north for their trajectory. I think that is, it's hard on a, um, you know, on a national level. Um, as payers, as a, from the payer perspective, what we can do is, is within the authorities that we have to enable those important conversations um, between uh, patients, people who happen to be patients at the time and the clinicians who are there to provide the care. I think the opportunities and the needs are far broader than that which is constrained to interactions within the healthcare system. So um, I, I think what we need to do, and, and we have opportunities to knit together the individual pieces of care of detection, diagnosis, and management in, in episodes, Right, um, that is the framework for alternative payment models. Alternative payment models that then address outcomes that are really meaningful. The challenge we have is those outcomes that are easier to measure are a starting point. Jenny mentioned some of those, including um, avoiding hospitalizations that are preventable. Right, of avoiding um, avoiding uh, unscheduled emergency department visits. That's a starting place that the system can understand. But I think the opportunities actually, and the need is for us to take a broader view, still being mindful of what we have at our disposal, administrative and, and key outcomes for health system. But we can't stop there. So um, I think the opportunities exist. But we want to be careful not to make assumptions for each and every person so that each person receives the care that really is truly aligned with what their goals are. So um, we're gonna, we have a lot of hands up. So I, and, I, and luckily, this session actually goes to 945. I was delighted to see. <laughs> so we have a little more time for discussion. So we'll go to Ian, then Orin, I see. And it's hard to see with the lights over there. Oh. oh, oh. Go ahead, Alan. Uh, yeah, nice. Ian Kramer from the Lead Coalition. I'll add to Sarah's appreciation for this remarkable panel and the work that all of you are leading, and Mike, for your personal testimony today and at so many other events to really bring the, the voice of the individual. And I won't call you a patient. You're a whole human being, and you put that on display for so many of us every day in, in the leadership you provide. Um, I'll just offer a, a couple of food for thought comments that perhaps will elicit a response for Kevin and then for Jeff. Uh, a number of large employers, perhaps the bank as well, offer the opportunity for many of their employees to do volunteer work uh, and get paid for it. And in the context of, I believe it is goal number three, yes, uh, increasing participation in research, I wonder if the bank would join other employers in considering and encouraging employers that you work with um, to allow employees to, volunteer, to be study partner volunteers using volunteer hours rather than vacation time or sick time. As you may be aware in, in Alzheimer's in particular, but certainly other conditions, individuals living with dementia or at risk for dementia are not allowed to participate in, in most research studies unless they have a family member or other formal or informal caregiver with them. And, and it would be great if, if bank employees could be those volunteers not having to tap into their own sick leave or their own vacation time, and if you could encourage other employers. And, and before I put you on the spot for an answer about what the bank might be doing or interested in doing in that regard, I just offer a question uh, in a similar vein for Jeff. Uh, as you know, there are tremendous new resources at the National Institute on Aging, particularly on the care research side. And one of the constant struggles we have, whether it's biomedical research or care research, is recruitment of people who will volunteer themselves to be subjects of that caregiver training. And I wonder to what extent Homestead is or would be available to consider 
uh, an affirmative, proactive position in, in those 90,000 homes where you are every day of encouraging those families to look at particularly the care intervention studies as volunteer opportunities. Do you want me to start? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in first then. Sure. I don't know that I understand the question without a sports metaphor though, Ian. So if you could <laughs> try to get my head around the, yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, we would love to, we've done some uh, and uh, we'd love to do more. So right now we're working very hard to put in place um, some data collection tools and standardization things which, which would enable um, and facilitate all of that. We think 80 million hours of care and the number of homes and, and having care on average in the United States, we're in, we're in the home for 25 hours. So we're a real coach and training, equipping our caregivers. I think that would elevate their level of professionalism too if they understood that part of their work was to uh, help advance research studies. So uh, it's something that we would love to do. We aspire to do it. We're working to put some pieces in place so that we're, we're able to do exactly that. Um, so a couple things. Yeah, I mean, I think you've hit on a, the, the, the bank. I'll talk about us. I'm sure other firms are doing this. Certainly, there's a much greater emphasis on volunteering in general. I would say that. Um, and to your, your point, recognition of volunteering as an important element um, that someone who's employed by the bank is taking time beyond just their basic job to do things that are right and important in their community. I would answer that, Ian. I, I don't think it goes as deep as you've said, quite frankly. We have done a lot of volunteering around the recognition of Alzheimer's, um, the, the community events that exist to recognize, uh, the walks for uh, um, Alzheimer's and things like that, and we've done a lot of that. I think we're still in the early stages, as you're suggesting, certainly would love to engage in that conversation about how can we take volunteering even deeper, the way you suggested, as a bank, as a firm, as our own employees, given the emphasis on volunteering. I would also offer two other ways we can influence. You're right, we deal with lots of companies. We deal with lots of companies and their employees and the benefits that they get. So we obviously have that reach. We also want to be relevant in communities. We, want, you know, we don't you know, we just want to be a bank that people say, oh, they're banks there and go. We, we have a community of what we call market presidents. Their job is to be relevant in the community and the issues of the community, something you're suggesting, and how can we help as a firm with our employees in that community do that? So I would absolutely love to engage deeper in that and find out how we can do even more than we're doing. Great, uh, Orion Bell. I should, if I could just. Go ahead. I just wanted to say, I'm actually personally going through that exact issue right now. I was called to ask if I want to participate in a trial, went through the whole screening process and part of the protocol is I have to have a care partner with me. And my wife still works a full-time job. So to try to have her get out of work for the amount of times that I would have to go there. Now I explained to them, I'm still capable. Um, and again, for me, this is all about stigma. It's automatically preconceived that I, because I have dementia, I can't no longer do things. Well, I managed to get from Massachusetts to here and I'm gonna to manage to get from here back home. So I think I could get to the you know, location to get the trials done. They are trying to you know, bypass that, but it is an issue. Thank you for that point. Orion. I think that uh, that story, is one of the challenges is that too much of the time we're treated as the sum of our medical diagnoses. Um, and we're commoditized, and our personal health data is not our own, and we're as likely to be targeted for something else to purchase as we are um, <laughs> in that treatment system. And I think the uh, another part of this conversation sometimes is that there's there's not an, there's not a representation from insurance here, but having watched my my parents deal with some long-term health issues in the last couple of years. And there has been as much trauma over what's covered and what's not, and some very dehumanizing conversations about something as basic as rehab on a knee repair that becomes very difficult, that has nothing to do with either the treatment or the necessary follow-up for it is, is that component. But I think the kind of the overarching part of this is particularly with chronic health and long, these are long-term conversations and they're, no, they're more than just a conversation with the person receiving treatment. These are family responses. They're very long-term. They're not episodic events. 
And I, I think uh, what, what I'd like to see is how we can look at this as a life issue, not a health treatment issue, but a life issue. The comment about you know choosing what I want to do, I think that's, that's maybe the most important thing mm -hmm. that's been said today about this is just that perspective. So, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah um, I, I thank you for bringing that up. Um, I thought you would think getting a diagnosis like this is the worst thing that you're going to hear or the worst thing that you're going to have to deal with, and it's not. It's having to navigate the system afterwards. It's having to fight for the benefits that you deserve or you, you think you need. It's, it's having to fight for insurances, <laughs> you know, denying you left and right on, on just about anything you can think of. Um, it's, it's really a, a challenge and it's, it's scary. It's, it's, I don't want to make it, you know, really, I can't say what I really want to say. <laughs> But it, I'll, I'll just stop there. But it's, it really is a challenge. Well, thank you for that powerful um, testimony. And I just feel yesterday we did have someone from, uh, from Providence St. Joe's Health System. And so I just wanted to put a plug in. We also talk about creating age-friendly health systems. Um, and I really, you know, working, which I know part of the movement there is to really work into the community, too, so that we are looking at the whole person and not just uh, labeling people by their diagnosis and trying to make sure that people get all that they need in their homes and their communities um, and you know that being the goal. Um, Alan Stevens. Hi, I'm Alan Stevens from Baylor Scott and White Health of Texas. Um, great comments, wonderful uh, information. Uh, Kevin, if I can go back to your comments and uh, around uh, uh, banking, and you made a specific comment about the importance of working with managers and supervisors mm. of caregivers. There's been a long-standing belief that caregiving came with a stigma mm -hmm. in the workforce, particularly at the level that you're talking about. So thank you for doing something. But what about the larger uh, uh, industry, the larger HR community? Do, do you see any activity in, in, in at that level to work across systems? Um, yes, and I think that's early stage, quite frankly. I mean, so yes, we are starting to see that, and we're starting to see, it, look at, I mean, I'm gonna be a capitalist for a minute here. Companies, what do they see? They see productivity issues. They see stress issues. They see cost of healthcare issues do that. So, I mean, I'm going to say, and I'm not going to be negative here, but certainly that economic impact, they've now woken up and said, wait a minute, what's going on here? So I think in the early stage, but as I said earlier, I think there's also an issue right now that companies believe they are doing something, but they're not doing enough. They're not doing enough. So I, I, we're starting to work with that HR community and say this is a new form of benefit, equally important as anything else you're doing, given the the impact on the workforce. And the last thing I'd say is, it is not just mid-stage, older stage career people. It is millennials. It is multi-generational. Mm -hmm. So when you say an HR person touches your entire employee base, that gets their attention, plus the other things I said. And then the critical thing in working with policymakers and companies is, what is the effective form of benefit that is robust enough, including things like networks and otherwise, to get them to see it like any other benefit they're offering their employee, early stage. Okay, we're out of time. I'm going to go to Jill Lesser to make one last comment. You have half a second. No, I'm kidding. Go ahead. Uh, uh, does Alan have one? Oh, or you took, okay, go ahead, please. Uh, you Jill, know, I, I, so partner. I'm Jill Lesser. I'm president of Women Against Alzheimer's and a founding board member of Us Against Alzheimer's. And first of all, I'm going to have to say thank you to Nora. Um, and in particular, what I, I really wanted to point out in this study is I feel like this is the first time where we're talking about the whole spectrum of brain health. And you know, every single day, so this morning, Wall Street Journal, more about diet and exercise and preserving your brain health. And I would just, you know, listening to Secretary Azar yesterday talking about value-based care and what we are ultimately trying to do when we look at the Medicaid budgets at state level, when we look at what we're trying to really change 
moving away from fee-for-service to a different model. Um, I would say in our, in our current system, we're still thinking from an Alzheimer's perspective. And at our conference last week, one of the scientists, a leading scientist on a panel said something that really struck me, which is 90% of dementia diagnoses in this country today happen in what would be analogous to stage four cancer. And that is not acceptable. So that even in the situations we do have, a few people being cognitively assessed in an annual wellness visit, we're still coming for this disease. We're not doing that for cancer. We're not doing that for heart disease. We're not doing that for diabetes. We're having all sorts of conversations about prevention, about risk reduction, and about most importantly, and I think this is where the screening thing is really important, uh, about knowing where we are as a human being and then as subtle changes happen, those subtle changes can be seen quickly and the new drugs coming down the pike, and there's been an exciting announcement over the last week, um, you know, are about intervening really early. We don't have that population of people. We, we, we don't know who they are. And so I would just say, as you do your tough work of managing through a system and building evidence, that this framework that Milken has put together, which looks at the whole trajectory, I think there's a, we need to disrupt Alzheimer's and we need to, we need to think about it differently. So um, thank you for your work. Um, I would hope that we can move quickly. Thank you, Jill. And, and I just wanna say, uh, before we close, is uh, a lot of people have said thank you, Nora. I helped lead this effort, but it was a whole team effort. So a great group of colleagues at the Milken Institute that helped me, many, many partners here in the room and people that couldn't be here. So like, you know, uh, all the, the tough uh, edits Thank you I for attending from, the session. From my friends <laughs> at CDC and CMS. It's, it's a better product because we had so many people involved and it's gonna take all of us to make it better for everyone. So I just thought this was an amazing panel you all did such a great job. So please join me in thanking everyone for this great presentation.